All righty, we are live. Let people join on in. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to give it a minute or so to um, let people roll in from other meetings, quick bathroom breaks. Um, but we have an amazing group of panelists today for our Accelerate Roundtable, um, which we are super excited for. Please chat in where you're from. We have a variety of um, locations joining us today, a variety of nonprofits. Um, and we want to hear where you're from. Um, so yes, we'll give it another minute or so. Welcome, welcome. All righty. All right, we're gonna let people join on in, but because we have an awesome presentation today, I do wanna kick it off. Um, hi everybody, my name is Kelsey Dupont. I am with Daxco. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Accelerate Roundtable. We have an amazing uh, group of panelists with us today, um, and we're also partnered with Community Rec Magazine. I will hand it over to Brittany, um, an editor, in just a moment, but I do want to say we have over a hundred people registered for today's special session. Um, so with that, all, everybody who is joining is muted just to cut down on background noise, but we want this to be super, super interactive. So feel free to chat in questions. Um, let us know your thoughts along the way. If, if we do want this to be very engaging and, and have this time for people to share um, community impact and what they're doing to propel into 2022. So with that, I will hand it over to Brittany. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all again. Um, like Kelsey said, I'm Brittany. I'm the editor of Community Rec Magazine. Um, if you haven't heard of us before, we are a free business resource for YMCA, JCC, and community recreation professionals. Um, if you would like any more information on that, please feel free to reach out to me directly or look us up. Um, but today, our publication is super excited to partner with DaxCo again for their next Accelerate Leadership Roundtable. Um, so today we'll be discussing various approaches nonprofit leaders are taking into the new year as their community needs continuously evolve. Um, I'll just go through and introduce each of our panelists. So we have Sabrina Smeltz, the Chief Executive Officer at the Wakeman Boys and Girls Club. We have Roman DeCorte, the Vice President of Membership, Marketing and Digital Strategy at the YMCA of San Diego County. And we have Jill Zoria, the Director of Marketing Strategy and Development at the Butler County Family YMCA. Um, and our host today is Stephanie Thornton, the Chief Revenue Officer at DaxCo. Um, so like Kelsey said, um, please feel free during the discussion, if you have any questions, send those over in our Q&A feature. We will discuss those at the end. Um, and I believe that is all the notes that I had. I'm gonna hand it over to Stephanie to get us started. Good. Yes, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks for the intro and thank you for um, the panelists for joining today. It's going to be a really good discussion. Um, we'll just jump into the first question. Um, Roman, I'll, I'll start with you with the first question. So, you know, as we begin our approach uh, to the new year, um, given all the changes that we've had um, that happened in, in 2020, you know, how do you see your community's need evolving in 2022? Uh, very, very good question. Um, so the first thing we noticed is, um, you know, starting in the, about the middle of the summer, uh, is parents were eager to find activities for their kids uh, to get the social interactions that they've been missing. Schools here in San Diego, public schools have been clo were closed um, throughout the 2020-2021 uh, 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 school year. So uh, summer camp did really well. Uh, we had some really robust uh, enrollments. Um, there was lots of demand for before and after schools now that schools are reopening. Um, our biggest challenge, honestly, is responding uh, to the community need because staffing is really, really challenging. We have some programs that despite the demand, we can't run because of st staffing shortage and the, really the, the difficulty of uh, hiring people and, and be able to roll over those programs quickly. Uh, but I would say our uh, kids programs are doing very well. Gymnastics is doing very well. There seem to be a lot of demand for youth sports as well, and we're relaunching that. Um, I would say outdoors um, remains preferred uh, for kids. Um, that, that seems in our data that we see seems to be pretty obvious. Uh, membership is a, is a 
is a different ball game. I feel from what we see, the growth is coming back. What lower point was about 32% of our pre-COVID me uh, memberships. Within three, four months, we got back to 55%. And now it's sort of stalling there. Um, our seasonality in San Diego is maybe different from the East Coast. We usually peak in the summer. And then as we get towards the end of the year, it gets pretty rough. And then we rebound a little bit in January. So we're fighting both seasonality um delta variant coming back so i right. the, the the yeah the fitness game is going to be a little bit different i think we're going to have to uh, continue to meet members where they want to be met um and the workout at home habits is, is a thing um that's right. not going to go away so we're kind of navigating this so that need is going to evolve a little bit on the fitness side of things and i think it's going to be mostly driven in our business by um programs is going to be a big big piece even bigger piece than before for us yeah, yeah, to totally agree. And we're gonna, we're actually, you hit on a lot of a lot of topics that, that we'll be talking about today, especially employment um, or lack thereof. Um, I'll go to Jill uh, with the same question. So, just again, as we have, you know approach the uh, the new year in twenty twenty two, just kind of how do you see your your uh, community in in Pennsylvania evolving? Yeah, um, you know, in some ways. You know, we talk to each other, the leadership team, and to members, and to our folks that are in our sponsored families program, and our youth mentoring kids, and our mentors, and community um, leaders um, across the board. And, you know, when you think about needs, it's kind of easy to try to make it so complex and to really, um, you know, deep dive in ways. But what we found is that really it's pretty much just your basic needs. The community is hurting. They've been isolated. They have been sedentary. They're alone. And really it's just, you think about the hierarchy of needs. So we all learned many years ago, probably like 101, but I mean, really they wanna feel loved. They wanna, uh, the community, our members, everyone just wants to feel like they belong. They wanna feel like they're important. It's been um, a crazy year and a half. And I just feel like um, the why is trying to be that friend we want to love up on them. And I think that's whether it's programs or just phone calls or just sitting down and having a coffee with them in the lobby. Um, it's really just simple back to basics for us. Yep. Yep. And, you know, that's, you know, kind of what, what Roman said too. I mean, it's, it's part of a community. And I think we thought that, you know, we would, that going virtual might be a good thing, but it seems like everybody wants to now get back together and just kind of be, be like it was. So we'll see what happens with, with the Delta variant, but um, so Sabrina, so thank you, Jill. Uh, Sabrina, so how about you? So in the Boys and Girls Club, very highly focused on uh, boys and girls. And um, so what, what's your take on that going into 2022? Yeah, I think I would definitely echo Roman and Jill. Um, we obviously are focused at the Boys and Girls Club on just youth. Um, and just youth is our three-year-old, you know, three-year-olds all the way up to our, we call them our junior staff. So our high school staff into our young adults. Um, I think really some of the things that we're looking at from the community is how do we have time to connect? How do we give families time to connect, kids time to connect in a safe way? How do we have give family time in a, in a space that um, in our, whether it's in our facilities or giving access to that? And that need, I, again, echoing but what both Roman and Jill said, the time, the need for social interaction, social emotional learning, how are we engaging that, um, understanding that we now are serving kids kids, we, uh, we come from a, an urban environment and a suburban environment, and we do, we've always had trauma-informed care lenses, but that trauma-informed care lens has now increased traumatically, right? Like, so, in, or exponentially, I should say. So, how are we looking at that? How are we, and then our staff are also involved in that trauma as well. And so, how are we handling those, giving support to our staff? Back to Roman's comment, too, of, like, we're, we are short-staffed. We have, gro we're growing as an organization in the middle of all of this. How is that happening? Because there's need for the kids to have this interaction. We've added two school sites. That's great, but we have to be able to staff them. And so right. how are we doing all of this and mixing? And I think that the evolving community need is number one, knowing that you, you don't have to do this alone, right? So Wakeman Boys and Girls Club or any YMCA separately, and we all sort of know this, 
um, we're not charged with always doing it just by ourselves. So it's how are we meeting people where they are? How are we meeting other community partners to be able to rally and do things together? We worked with the YMCA, our local YMCA during remote learning because we knew we had to divide and conquer in a, in a town. So how are we being examples of how other leadership organizations can come together and serve the community as a whole. So I think that's really how our, our needs are evolving. Um, it's challenging. We're in a city and then we're in a suburban community. And so, so what works in one doesn't always work in the other, right. um, but there's access, right? And again, I think Roman, you said this, you got to meet people where they are. Right, you know, co collaboration, um, involvement, things of that moves at the speed of trust. And so, if you're able to meet people where they are, listen. I think listening has been a really big key for us. Um, we're able to provide the programs and the vehicles to be able to do that. Yeah, and I think you know the the theme here is definitely community for the you know boys and girls club, whatever. It's just finding that community, and you hit you know you hit on finding that space, like what. It needs to, it needs to, like, what space is it, you know, and it may not be right for suburban or, you know, for a different community. So it's very, very important. Um, thank you all for, for, for answering those, uh, that question. Um, moving on to, the, to another question. So when we think in terms of, um, you know, revenue, what, what are some things, I'll start with you if you don't mind, uh, Sabrina, what are, what are some things, especially coming as a CEO, that you know you see as your greatest revenue opportunities um, as you move into 2022. Yeah, that's a great question. I think we're all trying to figure that that answer out. I will. I'm going to frame this a little bit with knowing that there are many YMCA. I, I say books of business here. The Boys and Girls Club is a little bit different of a of a business model in the fact that and I just kind of lay this out there. We're about a four million dollar operation. Um, 60% of our revenue or our operating budget comes from philanthropic dollars. So most of our revenue is not program revenue, like sign up for a class, sign up for a men membership. So the, our lens and how we look at that definitely changes. Um, but what we're doing when it comes to program revenues and access, because we still have to keep the doors open and the lights on and all of that, like we all do. Um, it's how are we giving access, you know, in, in the, before COVID, we would get this mad rush in August of memberships and program registrations because people were like, oh, I know I'm going to go to Wakeman, not sure what a how and when, but we're just going to sign up. We're not seeing that now, right? You're seeing sort of people pick and choose as they need. Um, and so we want to be accessible for them. So some of the things we looked at is how are we tiering our prices? How are we giving access to all in a way that's creating less barriers? So we all know that we, we all offer financial assistance. We all do it that way. Like, how are we able to streamline that process? Um, we have after school program fees. We have other fees. So we've tiered them based on income, um, which I'm sure other, you know, again, this is, I'm not, saying anything that others haven't seen before, right. but we, this was new to our organization. What we found was that now people who were like, oh, I don't want to pay the full price right away because I'm not sure, were like, wait, but I do fit in this category. I'm now going to come and have access. So as we're looking at how we are recapturing people to come back, there's an opportunity for us to get, meet people where they feel Fin their financial threshold is. And so we're sort of breaking that up to give them options. So that's how we're going after that revenue. Um, and we're seeing signups, we're seeing the sports, the yeah. sports leagues. We had basketball leagues with 400 to 600 kids in our PE wow. program. It's smaller, right? But it's, it's right. building. Um, our summer camp this last year had the highest uh, camper week registrations in the last five years. Um, and so again, they're outside We're you know, we'll see what happens inside because we're in New England and I'm not sure, sure how all the basketball stuff's going to going to fly, but we're, we're moving in that direction. So I think it's, it's looking at those ways to give access to all that's, that's removing barriers that may not have been there pre COVID. You've had, you know, 17 years in the YMCA. Uh, movement before coming over to Boys and Girls. So you're, you, you have to think about it differently now. I mean, still nonprofit, but just Correct. different clientele, if you will. Different and the same, right? I say we can yeah. 
I said this before, where I, I drank the youth serving Kool-Aid a long time ago. I'm just drinking a different flavor. And so everything yeah. that's applicable in the why is applicable to us in a different way. And I know I can see some of the people who are on this call, some of my former why colleagues. So I see them all on here, but um, it's, you know, it's, it's how do you make it work for your community? Because every yeah. community is different. Every need is different. I'm ser we're serving two communities and we do things differently. Um, sure. And it's just being able to be flexible, which I think in any of us as a, as a nonprofit and a youth serving organization, we've, been, we've learned how to be very flexible. Yeah, so true, so true. Um, well, thank you, uh, Sabrina. Jill, uh, I'll go to you because with you, you have a lot of outside influence um, outside of, of YMCA, and uh, and then just you know being that the, the the marketing guru in your space. What are you thinking in terms of of revenue and some maybe some some new ideas uh, in in your Pennsylvania wise? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, if you would have asked that same question two years ago, year and a yeah. half ago, three years ago, the answer would be different. I mean, we put a lot of, um, and we do run dual roles as most YP folks do, right? Yeah. Um, so marketing and development are actually tied together um, at our association. And so, you know, when we look at acquisition of new members, retention, churn reduction, I mean, those were things that were the kind of the big buzzwords and how do we target and build models and go after people that look like our best, um, members that are bringing us the, you know, the high uh, revenue so that we can, like Sabrina said, keep the lights on while we all have to operate and pay our right. staff a fair wage. Um, so, you know, that would have been membership would have been our focus, but, uh, you know, COVID and, and the ongoing pandemic and, and variants uh, hit all of us. And so, you know, what has really been our shining star and um, is really uh, state licensed childcare. So one of our branches has state licensed child care and the other branch has uh, offers programs for before and after school. And um, there were, you know, we became very creative when everybody was shut down uh, businesses and we were open. So we, you know, we served uh, kids in that capacity so they could come to the Y and, um, you know, with their headsets on and uh, sit there and, and have their instruction via Zoom. But definitely child care. Um, we've sent out many uh, surveys in our community, and we do serve two different com communities. And they're, they're pretty much, uh, you know, polar opposites. One is right. more of a, right. a, a small city location that's been around for a lot of years. So um, definitely very tied into the community. They're very loyal to the why. Um, wonderful when it, uh, as far as like fundraising and, and donation support. Um, and the other one is more transient. And it's it's quickly growing and it's, um, you know, only 20 minutes out of the city, uh, Pittsburgh. But, you know, we really think our, our focus is definitely childcare. Um, there's just so many, we're being asked by the school districts, we're partnering with the school districts, we're trying to be creative, we're, we're bringing the childcare to them, where they're busing the kids to us, we're, you know, from infants all the way up to sixth grade at 12 year olds. So, uh, that's definitely, um, you know, a, a revenue and also we're affordable. I mean, I had two little kids um, in, in daycare, uh, not at the Y, but, you know, years ago, they're grown, grown men now, but they, you know, it was expensive. It was so yeah. expensive. We had to make a decision. Does it even make sense to work? So for us to be able to provide the community with affordable and creative and flexible childcare, and of course, all the other wonderful things that the Y offers, right? The programs that make sense. You know, we talk, we understand what they need, what, what they're interested in. So, but the loss of learning, I mean, you know, we, we think there's so many things we can do with the child care and early learning centers at both branches. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 fantastic that, that you, you know, tapping into child care being, you know, YMCA's being so, some of the, you know, highest child care centers uh, in the nation or throughout the world for that matter. Um, very, very important. And that's, that's great to hear that that's kind of your shining star um, for your organization. So thank you for that. Um, so Roman, how about you? Um, do you any thoughts on childcare in, in the San Diego community or some, some different revenue opportunities and, uh, that you have uh, coming in 2022? Yeah, for, for us, prog um, program in general is the big yeah. revenue opportunity as, as most of them were shut down, um, you know, during the pandemic. Sure. We were, our executive staff at the branches and, um, you know, operating team has been tremendous in 
pivoting very quickly, we're able to provide um, distance learning support, um, which, which did well, but it, it doesn't compare to before and after care uh, programs. We're the number one provider of, uh, of those services for schools in San Diego County. So it's a big revenue opportunity. But I would say in general, what we really did during this pandemic is take a hard look at a portfolio of programs and you know, try to be strategic about where is the community need Let's focus on those programs that the community needs and be very intentional about the quality of the programs. And what we realized, I'll give you an example in youth sports, is the competition, unfortunately, with, uh, fortunately for us, but unfortunately for the competition, shrink quite a bit during the pandemic. A lot of companies that were offering those services are gone. And what we also realize is our business model is challenging from a quality standpoint because we're relying on volunteers right, to provide the curriculum, right. to provide the experience to kids. And we don't have to be experts at everything we have, but we have partners in the community that can help us provide a quality and affordable program. And that's really, we've been very intentional, particularly we're starting with sports and bringing those partnerships. We have a professional soccer team in San Diego we're partnering with, they're going to provide us some curriculums that then uh, can be delivered to the kid through those volunteer courses that will go through an onboarding um, uh, program uh, with this team. So that's really, we're really focusing on reducing a little bit the portfolio and being very intentional about quality. And then another thing we're looking at also, uh, like Sabrina, is pricing, right? Yeah. Making sure that we're able to keep the lights on and remain, and that's very important, accessible, um, you know, across all our communities. Our communities are different, so we're looking at different types of pricing. Um, we're looking at how we can be really uh, strategic about our pricing strategy, both on the program side and on the on the membership side. So lots of things going on, but I think the uh, program right after the pandemic is really going to be where you we're going to see the most and the fastest growth. Are there any um, are there any programs that would be kind of new to your organization that maybe you might try or just something that you're seeing that could be a, a larger need as you go into 2022, just as things have changed? Um, not one that I can think of uh, in terms of being completely new. The one that was really new that 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 honestly was a um, fairly successful and, and provided us with, with good revenue was uh, distance learning support, um, okay. something that we started out of necessity. Um, but as far as getting completely new programs, we're evaluating eSport uh, okay. We saw a lot of uh, positive feedback on eSport uh, in terms of social connections, especially for kids, um, you know, that, that may be on the autism spectrum. There's some really great benefit mm -hmm. here. Um, so we're looking at those things. We're exploring some, some different types of options. Um, but launching right now and, and saying that it has a, a tremendous revenue opportunity right now would be a little bit um, right. optimistic. Okay. We're just looking at what is out there that we, or is not out there? What can we, what can we bring? Um, and, and again, not get what we tend to do sometimes at the Y, unfortunately, is we tend to offer so much um, that it's, yeah. it's a little bit, not only confusing for the, um, for the, for the, you know, the public, the community, but it's also a little bit hard, right, to manage all the extensive right. portfolio. So we're more looking at, you know, restricting and being very, very intentional um, than expanding like crazy our portfolio. Right. Rome, and that doesn't just happen at the Y. That happens at other places, too. <laughs> Good to know. Or even, or even maybe downsizing the portfolio, too. If there were yep. any programs that just don't make sense, hmm. you know. Absolutely. So still still thinking about the future, um, and I'll maybe start off with Jill on this one. Just, just thinking about, like, initiatives that um, – might be most exciting for your organization that either you're thinking about implementing or you already implemented um, that, you know, just kind of would transform your community um, even more than, than now? Is there any kind of initiatives that you guys are thinking about? Well, I, I think, I mean, there's a couple things. Um, one thing that stands out is certainly the virtual why, right? I mean, yeah. providing access to workouts and content and, um, educational information and inspiration um, for all the people that are still a little nervous. They're still kind of stuck in their homes. Um, and, you know, we put, I remember um, 
when we closed on March 16th of 2020, and we, there was about a, a five-day time frame where a team of us pretty much didn't sleep because we're like, we've got to turn this into a virtual Y branch, yeah. and how we're going to meet people, you know, and how can we take care of them um, during a time where they can't walk into the building. And so we are, we're definitely super proud of our, our virtual Y branch, and, you know, I'm not sure it's quite to the transformative <laughs> phase yet. That's a big, yeah. big word. But you know what? It is transforming the way people see us. Um, you know, uh, we still have 30% of our uh, members that aren't coming back to the building right now. And so I think it's important that they feel that connection. And that kind of ties back to the revenue question, right? So yeah. if they continue paying their membership dues because they feel connected to the why. So they're, you know, we're sending them emails, we're calling them, we're showing them how to connect to the virtual why, uh, no matter their age or um, situation. And so, and there's classes on there, you know, of our wonderful senior folks doing chair yoga and, yeah. you know, Parkinson's classes. And then there's, you know, family classes and people that want to ride their Peloton at home. I didn't say that because we <laughs> offer class, but, you know, um, they can take our, our cycle classes too. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely an important channel for us for that connection factor. But I think one thing too, uh, Stephanie, is just really how do we get that the two thirds of the, um, the community is not moving. They're not yeah. moving very much. They still, um, and so a huge uh, transformation would be for how do we get to those people that are, are not moving, they're not understanding that health and well-being and staying active and a healthy diet and, and meal planning. You know, we have a full kitchen. Uh, you know, we serve food uh, all day long, you know, for our, our child care kiddos at one of our branches. And uh, we have cooks and stuff. You know, are there things we can do? And one of our branches, people, you know, it's, it's declared a food desert. Uh, there's, you know, people are, are buying their food, food items from, from Dollar General, you know, the dollar store sure. and, and maybe... Um, uh, a convenience store. So meal planning around that, that we can offer. So again, kind of um, what the panel's been saying, tapping into what we're good at and then supporting yeah. the community. And, and you know, that's transformative um, in itself. No, I think it's completely transformative. And I think a lot, you know, everybody was kind of a lost sheep uh, when it all happened. It's like, wh what do we do? And what is this virtual world? And, you know, how can I still stay connected to people? How, how is that? And how do I use all this technology to do it with? And I think it's been a, a challenge, at least with the leaders that, that I've talked to, is just trying to figure this out. And, and I do think it's transformative. I really do. Um, Absolutely. Talking on the phone is transformative. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Pricing the basics, calling all of our members, and we have thousands of, of members, and, you know, just that was one of the biggest saves for us where people continue to pay their dues or they converted them to a donation, which was wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just again, that human connection is so important. And, and we all know, we all learned the hard way, how important and transformative um, human connection and touch is. So. Sure. And we want to, you know, we want to keep our arms around those that we have, but we also, you hit the nail on the head. It's like, how do we go out in that community and, and really now put our arms around the folks that, that we need to get, like that need the help, that want the community, but don't know how to get it. So I think that's serious and definitely key. So um, couldn't agree with you more. So Sabrina, uh, how about you? Uh, any Anything that you've implemented now or, or thinking about in the future? Yeah, I would say it's still in its infantile stages. Um, we've always served teens. Um, I think teens in, in any community at this point in time with COVID have been a a challenge, right? They didn't need to be supervised while they're remote learning or things of that nature. So I, I would, I'm going to make a large assumption that a lot of us have lost our teens um, or need to recapture them in a different way. Um, and actually, one of the one of the things that we're working on with the, in the city of Bridgeport, again, infantile stages, is how we give teens access, right? And not just access to the Boys and Girls Club, but access to all youth serving organizations. So we're actually working on. I'm calling it we call it an easy pass for teens but you know we don't want to we we have to be we have to be creative right like we don't have the funding to just necessarily go build a teen center or to do this right. or change things that are happening but if we can utilize all organizations that are running think programs for teens in a way that's going to be unified in a fact of like if Wakeman's not open at this time for an open gym time but this community center is and the, you know like how are we doing this and so we're rallying around 
um, that opportunity, le trying to leverage some funding through the Rescue Act and things of that nature, but also we're challenged with, because of teens sort of being lost, the gun violence has increased. Um, and then, you know, so we also think about workforce development, which sort of ties into that. How are we giving our teens access to job skills and career readiness, which we do all the time uh, anyway, but how are we strengthening that? So those are some of our big initiatives that are, I'm not going to say like, I, I and have somebody like, can you give me the roadmap? I don't have the roadmap yet. We're still figuring <laughs> that out. Um, it was one of those things in the shower that I was like, wait, we got to give kids access, right? And yeah. I can't, we can't do it all. Um, so that's one of them, safe spaces, things of that nature, but being collaborative and, and, and cooperative with other organizations. The other thing that sort of came out of this with COVID, um, and Roman, you sort of talked a little bit about other youth sports organizations and things like that. In the city of Bridgeport, um, we had a, a grassroots group of our, our Bridgeport natives that said, listen, our kids were playing tackle football, which I know everyone goes, oh my God, tackle football, but, um, and for our youth. And so we have now um, in the city of Bridgeport with home, I say homegrown with Wakeman Boys and Girls Club, we have 95 kids playing youth tackle football from third grade to eighth grade. Like who'd have thought, and it's, it's a yeah. big program. And to be honest, sometimes it's a bigger program than like what our other programs were, but those are almost 95 of those kids were kids who were not coming to our club or having access because they were playing football or doing what have you. So we've actually, they now are part of our after school program. They go to, they walk to the field because the practice field is right down the street from the clubhouse. Um, and then walk back to our clubhouse so that they all have dinner together as a team. So we're serving dinner to 95 kids um, and sometimes their families. And so, and that's using the Nutrition Center and CACFP and other things. So it's, it's using other community organizations, restaurants yeah. are coming and serving and things of that nature. So that has come out of like our football program fell apart. We know Wakeman has, uh, Boys and Girls Club has a strong sort of administrative wrap around of things and we've been able to leverage that so those have been two great new initiatives teens and youth football which I, again i never i if you asked me a year ago the teens i would have said the football i would have been like no way right, <laughs> right. but it's been amazing and and again we now have a group of parents um, from a whole bunch of pockets of communities that we are not necessarily in as a facility um, yeah. that are coming to the table and wanting to be part of committees and be part of rallying around things. So this grassroots community, and we're in a capital campaign where we're about to break ground on a new clubhouse further into the heart of Bridgeport. And it's, a, it's really great timing for us. So I know th th this is, Great, thank you so much for sharing that. I just, it's just, I love it. Um, so I, I know you said you don't have a roadmap because you're just trying to figure it out, but when you go back to teens, are you just, for those others that are listening, are you like rallying around leaders in the community? Like how are you starting your conversations with these other leaders that, that aren't yeah. maybe boys and girls clubs? Or? Sure, yeah. So we, we, they, we there's definitely, um, we youth serving agencies talk. So, you know, here's what I did. I picked up the phone and I called the Y because I know the Y. Sure. Um, <laughs> and I called our, we have the Sheehan Center, which is through, um, we have a couple youth serving, serving centers that are through the, Catholic Church. Um, we also have another uh, in, in the East End. And I called them all at the executive directors and I said, let's talk about this. Um, and we got together and we said, you're right, let's see what we can do. Again, there's still a roadmap, right? We're still doing our own things. We're still leveraging funding separately at this moment in time. We're sort of marking that out, but it's how do we now, how do we rally together in ways that we can just give access to kids. It doesn't mean we have to recreate the wheel. It's how right. we communicate the, the availability of it. Um, and then obviously some, we pulled the hospital in. So we said, listen, we might need like a navigator to help this because I don't have the staff to help sort of facilitate this. We all don't, yeah. right? We're like, wait a minute, let's just add some more to somebody else because that doesn't always work. Um, <laughs> and so, and we know that, right? Yeah. So how are we leveraging other support? The hospital has, I, I know they have nurse navigators, right? And they connect and they collaborate. So can we find a way through their foundation 
to get funding for someone to help rat like connect all the dots for us. Yeah. Um, and so those are that's the primary roadmap. I think to me, it's I, I, I take a look at a problem and I say, all right, how do we fill this gap? What do we have and what are we missing? It's kind of like building a team, right? I, my background's in athletics. So I say, all right, how are we going to, how am I going to put all my players on my team and make them perform in the best way they possibly can? So the team players right now are all the youth serving organizations in the city of Bridgeport. We have facility based ones and we have non facility based ones. So we're, that's how we're sort of having those conversations and again, meeting people where they are. So you, we have to be okay with, the concept of this one may be all in, this one may be like, eh, I'm not so sure. Okay, well, right. come back to us when you're ready. If you're not ready, that's okay too. And we have to be okay with that. And I think COVID has allowed yeah. people to open that door a little bit more um, and have those conversations. So I know that sort of is a, a general yeah. answer for the roadmap. I and mean, that's why I say I don't have a full roadmap. Yeah. But I think it's, you know, you think about active listening, your listen first skills for your why for the why people, um, and and how are we how are we finding a way to solve a problem, and understanding that myself as a CEO of of a boys and girls club, I don't have to be the driver all the time. Yeah, right? I just have to help bring the bring everyone to the table, and it's okay for us to work together. And it goes back to meeting people where they are. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's fantastic. Lots of really good initiatives and ideas coming from from the three of you. So hopefully that's helping the listeners um, with some with some really good ideas going into 2022. Um, so the next the next topic is is kind of near and dear to all of us because we wouldn't be able to do really a lot of things without fundraising. <laughs> so let's let's talk for a minute about about fundraising. And I'll, I'll start off with Roman. Um, you know, when we think of how crucial fundra fundraising is really just to aspects of nonprofits in general, you know, how does your 2021 fund fundraising look in comparison to um, like last year? And, um, and then do you plan to accelerate that effort um, next year? Yeah, so let me start with, because um, that's important, our fiscal year is July through June, right? Okay. So we, we really started um, campa uh, campaigning July 2020, so right when we were able to reopen in very, very limited capacity our, our facilities. But, um, but that fiscal year, so 2020 through uh, June 2021, was very strong. Um, we, we had really a lot of emergency um, philanthropic gift, uh, particularly around um, summer camp uh, with the community. So we had a really, really good, um, good time there. Uh, members continued to donate their um, paying their membership dues when we were closed, which also helped a lot. About 45% of our membership um, kept paying, uh, which was which was great support. Um, what we anticipate uh, moving into this new fiscal year for us um, is we feel like fundraising is going to go back to more normal levels. So what's going to happen is, you know, there's not going to be as many uh, emergency COVID uh, gifts as we had uh, during last fiscal year, uh, but we feel that annual campaign 2022 will be pretty strong. Um, yeah. What we're really trying to do now is in our marketing communication, um, you know, we tend to talk about the great work that we do um, when it's fundraising time. Um, and, and the rest of the time, you tend to really focus on pushing the business, right? So what we're trying to do now is what we realize is the why doesn't need brand awareness, so to speak, right? The brand is pretty well known, one of the most uh, recognizable brand um, probably in the US. But what it, what it needs is brand identity awareness. I, I, I feel despite all you know, the attempt from YUSA and what we see in our early research is people don't know all the things we do, particularly on the social services side of things. Um, so that's something that we want really, we really want to be very, very intentional year round. So, right. you know, talk, you know, we, we had some, some branches that were vaccination sites. Uh, we did food distribution. We did, you know, distance learning support. We did summer camp when nobody was daring to touch that um, in the summer of 2020. So we want to share all those great story of refugee sites. We do, we do lots of great work here, uh, but the, the community is not necessarily aware about it. Um, so I, we feel this will really help, um, again, um, 
you know, with the fundraising efforts, particularly annual campaign. Uh, we're also looking forward to focusing again on, on capital um, capital fundraising sure, as, sure. as we go through this, you know, what the after COVID looks like, right? There's going to be some strategic adjustment. We get new leadership coming into um, uh, in San Diego. So that's something that we look forward to focusing on again. Um, and the last one is our endowment has continued to grow during COVID. Uh, and we don't anticipate that this will stop. We anticipate this growth to, to keep going. So um, so again, I think we're going to have a, a, a very good fundraising year again um, this fiscal year. And um, spreading the word about all we do yeah. I think is, is, is absolutely key. Um, yeah. And that's something that we'll be very strategic and intentional about. Very good. Yes, couldn't agree more. Um, Jill, how about you? When we think of when we think of fundraising in, in nonprofits, you know, what what do, if you compare 2021 and um, comparison to last year, you know, what what do you think your plan is for the next year to accelerate fundraising or kind of some yeah. things to what run? Yeah, last year, you know, was a um, we took some time off from actively reaching out to okay. our donor base. And um, we just wanted everyone to have a little bit of space, right, until we understood where this thing was going to land. Um, and, you know, I think it's just important to, and this is kind of 101 as well, just tell the stories. And yeah. to Roman's point, um, it is hard to, for people to understand and for us to articulate our story of the people that we help. Um, um, that we serve in our community that lean on us day in and day out. And, you know, when you think about um, youth mentoring, I mean, that's a big part of what the annual support campaign funds um, in our association. And we're so very proud of our Reach and Rise program um, where we serve kiddos, you know, um, from like seven to, you know, 17 or five to 17. Um, we're just changing the age because the program's expanding. So it is that collaboration with the school districts and getting the word out to parents, um, you know, uh, because that is such an important program uh, that people don't know about. And so how do we tell the story um, of what we're able to do with these children for, you know, they could be in the program for a year, or for maybe longer, they can um, run an eight week session and do it again. And, you know, it's youth mentor based and small group. So we have a lot of kids that are very proud of where they've come. I mean, uh, a lot of these kids that go through this program that's funded um, through donations, 100% it's free um, to families across the area is, you know, they want to tell their story. They want to go on the radio. They want to be at our special events. And, you know, we had a little, uh, a young man on Monday night, we had our, one of our biggest fundraisers of the year. And there were 150, 160 people in the room on Monday night. I started, it was a golf outing for the children golf outing. And that's our, one of our biggest of the year. And, and this little gentleman, you know, he's 13 years old. He's, he's this kid who has had no confidence. He's run through the program twice now. And Bradley came up and told, he wanted to, he raised his hand. He told his parents when we asked, you know, who might want to do this. And in front of this kind of rowdy crowd of, you know, golfers that have been out all day on the, on the field, um, he sat up there on a microphone, on a podium and told his story. Like, I mean, people, we couldn't get them to be quiet for the life of us. No. And then yeah. just, you know, it was on and on. We're like, Shh. well, when Bradley took the floor, little 13 year old Bradley, and he told his story of how the schools didn't know what to do with him how his family didn't know how to interact. He couldn't articulate his feelings. He was lashing out, there was anger. That is the best way, in my opinion, and for us to get the word out. They don't wanna hear it from me or my team. Well, and they will hear it from us, but you, you know, they need to hear it from the families. So we have a lot of people that we, we call little couch chats where we'll sit down and just talk to them. You tell us what it means as a Y member. So, you know, I try to make a point to have sit down and have coffee with members that have never given to the campaign, to members that, you know, give a lot to non-members, to community leaders, but also to the families that are impacted by it because they're going to yeah. do the yeah. best job of getting that word out. And, you know, you can just see when we send that message out, whether it's email or social media, um, people respond, they're reaching out and they're like, how can we be a mentor? how can we donate to this program? Um, you know, when you have, you have family members coming in and literally tears streaming down their face because they think this is their last chance to
to, or their last, they have nowhere else to go when they've come to the youth mentoring program because the schools, you know, they're like, we don't know what to do with these children and other programs, you know, it's kind of before um, some of them, you know, maybe a juvenile um, situation where they're going into a, a program that they don't want to. And, and we take everyone and you'll have parents come in and they'll, they'll weep. Literally, we had a father come in. He's like, what do you mean it's free? Um, I make a decent income. We're like, hey, there's challenges uh, for all families, regardless of how much you make. So we don't have a mint max. So that's, that's just a huge way for us to, to play this game because we, we can't survive without it. Sounds like we need to get little Bradley on staff. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And we had another wonderful family get up uh, last year at the, at the golf outing. And it, it's just, um, it's humbling. It's humbling. Yeah. The rest of us go through years of communication classes and presenting, you know, to large groups and uh, have these little kids. Um, my two sons participated in the event as well. And they, after the event, they said, my goodness, you know, we're 24 years old and we, we didn't want to get up there on that mic. So it touched every single person in that room. I think he got a standing ovation. So that I feel like if I can, if I can do more of that, then I've really done our job. Yeah, um, makes you feel good. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Sabrina, how about you? Fundraising, near and dear to you too. It is, it's, it's um, <laughs> I, I'm an operations person originally, and, and yeah. uh, this has definitely, you know, you shift into a different role. Um, and, and I think about it, like we're all relationship builders. That's what we do in, in the grand scheme of our work. Um, I will say, I, I'm happy to share that our annual fund increased from last year to this year. And again, we have a, we have a funky fiscal year. So we go August to July. So it's sort of like we, we mirror the school sort of the school year yeah. um but we increased our, our annual support our annual fund um had saw an increase of 14 percent from last year to this to the awesome. to this next year um we prior to covid we already had a plan in place to shift a lot of our fundraising um you know our, our philanthropic i said earlier that 60 percent of our budget comes from philanthropic dollars yeah. and those are three different buckets it's individual gifts uh grants and foundations and special events. And so we're like, how do you, you know, how do you figure that out? Special events, you get sort of event fatigue. I'm sure everyone has talked about this. Um, and so prior to COVID, we were already working on how do we shift from special events to what I'm gonna call a major gifts program. And so we're more individual, like, you know, if you're getting a 25,000, and again, everyone's gift sizes are different. If you're getting a $25,000 gift, um, versus $25,000 from an event that took X number of staff time and things of that nature, what's the better, you know, what's your better ROI and how does that, you got to find your happy medium. Um, so we've shifted a lot. We're also in a capital campaign right now in the middle of COVID. So <laughs> it's been great. Timing. Um, and we're about ready to have shovel in the ground. So that's a $20 million capital campaign. And in the last since COVID um, in the last year, we've I've capped off, we've been able to raise close to 5 million on top of our, our annual fund. So again, and, it, and how people say, how did you do that? We told our story, just like Jill and yeah. Roman are saying, right? And right. so you have to tell your story. You have to tell your story all the time. We, when I first came to Wakeman, we just were like, yeah, people come to Wakeman. I'm like, you can't assume that they just know what we're yeah. doing. And they only know like this little part. Um, they don't know the full scope. And so, you know, we have been able to have individual conversations. We've definitely rolled out what I would call um, a structured annual giving program. We just rolled out this year, now a structured corporate giving program, which is not just sponsoring events. So we gave a menu um, and we've sent out a round tripper and then we have sort of a, and I'm welcome to, I'm more than willing to share it with everybody, but we are now giving options, not just for events, but for programmatic things. So you want to name, uh, you, you want to be our Keystone and Torch Club is like Leaders Club um, programs. You want to be the key, the Keystone premier sponsor for this year. You can have that. So what it's doing is it's also educating businesses in the area of all the programmatic things we're doing and telling our story without us having to tell the whole story. Yeah. Um, so those touch points we've increased, whether it's internet, you know, email, um, mailers, conversations, our unit advisory boards, our trustees, all of that. And so, and we're, we're 
conditioning our staff, and that sounds horrible to say it that way, but we're, we're the culture of our staff in meetings and how we operate regularly operationally is telling stories wow. so that they're used to telling the stories so that when we, I, I know all of you who are sitting on this call have been like, we need stories for our annual, like our annual report or whatever, or our fundraising. And, and then it's like crickets, right? And you know, yeah. there's stories. So we're conditioning our staff to tell the stories so that we can get them easier. Um, so those are sort of the things that we've been seeing and doing. And then I, I pulled this off. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's, it's going to be upside yeah. down. No, it isn't. Then, it's good. It, okay. So I say, and this is about telling your story, right? You got to remember the mission, but you have to keep painting the vision. Um, and so that, that painting can change. And so your story and how you present that, that all goes right back to relationship building and fundraising, which will increase the funding that comes in. That's, I'm done, sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. No, it's good. And the, and the three of you basically, you know, said the same thing. It's just, it's creating awareness in the community. Yeah. It's going to get those folks that don't know what, what the good is and what the, what you guys are doing for the communities. And it's just, I love that. It seems like all of us need to channel our inner Bradley and go and figure out how to tell that story. Joe, maybe we need to video him and, and pass that around nonprofits. He um, probably would. He's so yeah, proud. That's so, so proud. awesome. <clears throat> so um, Sabrina mentioned staff. Sabrina, I'll start with you on this one um, because, you know, staff, it's a, it's a problem everywhere. It's, it's a problem at Daxco. It's, it's a problem everywhere. But when we think of like, you know, operating with slimmer staff, um, you know, are there any tactics that, that you can share um, that your organization implemented to maybe streamline processes, um, increase efficiencies, or just, I guess, boost team morale? That, that may be number one, but yeah. any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think staff appreciation is always something that needs to happen. Um, we I we were very fortunate during um, I'm going to call it the shutdown time, and when we were all in these unknowns, yeah. our professional staff we were very fortunate that our board felt very strongly about it, and financially we were able to keep everyone employed. Right, so we yeah. that has that has been very fortunate for us. Um, we, you know, in our part-time staff that are coming back and sort of the, the programmatic staff, we, they have also, we have changed some roles to keep them more engaged, to give them things in that way. But we, I think it's appreciation. We have more meetings and check-ins with everybody. I'm at those meetings. It's just as important just because I'm the CEO doesn't mean I won't go clean a toilet. And I know we all know that stuff, right? Like, so it's, but it's really important that I'm sitting at tables with people having lunch, being in the middle of after school programs. I, I've been a bus monitor so that we're, hey, we all know we're in this. Like, what do you need me to do? I was at the football field handing out helmets. Like, yeah. all right, I'm going to figure it out. Um, and then we have we have regular town hall meetings and giving access and so now we've been doing some of them virtual and in person we've all been direct service in person anyway so we're already there. Yeah. Um, but to get feedback more often, and we found ways to increase our wages. Um, and, and so in that budget and our, our board is really firm on we want to take care of our staff. We're a people business, right? And yep. we can't serve people without, without our staff teams. Like that's, that's where we put most of our money, right? In our budgets. That's where we're spending. It's where we can control our wages and our spending too. But we also have to find ways to do that. So that's sort of the quick way yeah. that we've been doing things. Great. Yeah, we're, we're kind of mirroring those same same things at Daxo. And again, it kind of goes back to community. It's like, just don't forget about everybody. Let's get everybody together. We're all in this together. So, um, Roman, how about you in, in San Diego? What um, Any thoughts or ideas on, on staff and morale and what are you guys doing there? Yeah, so the, the first thing we did when the pandemic hit is create a centralized business center and call center uh, just to gain some, some efficiencies. So they handle really all the backend work. Uh, it'd be, you know, um, operating system management, uh, scholarship applications to give you a few membership draft preparation, all this type of work. The call center was really created out of necessity because our branch is being closed. When we opened summer camp, we had nowhere for people to go as we were dispersing the, the grant uh, that, that we received. 
could not leverage the website for that. So we had to create a structure in order to be able to take care of those registrations. And then we expanded on it. The, the challenge with those two entities is those are really tough work. It's tough yeah. work. And so staff turnover is pretty big. Um, and so you, it's a work in progress, right? You constantly have to train, you constantly have to rehire. Sure. And we know the challenges with hiring. Um, the staff burnout is real at every level in our organization too. Zoom fatigue is, is one of the uh, symptoms, but uh, there, there are some others. Um, so tactics we do is, for example, in my team in marketing, um, so we had to centralize marketing during the pandemic too. We were not as fortunate as Sabrina. We had to cut lots of staff. Um, so what we start doing is we are a service uh, department. And so we starting rotating our staff between the branches uh, to show support on the field. Our CEO goes to various branches every single day, CEO as well. So we're just being there to help and to, to show that we're in this together. Um, we did some, some bonuses over the summer um, with staff. <laughs> We're also looking right now at, at increasing um, wages uh, for frontline staff in particular. Um, we always say taking care of your community starts with, with your employees, right? And yeah. so, so we're, we're, we're trying um, to put that together, uh, but, uh, and, and focusing also leadership is focusing heavily on, on team culture uh, and making sure that, that we as, as, as a group of uh, people um, behave in the way that our culture dictates. And, and being very intentional about collaboration, uh, alignment. Um, so those are things we're doing. Um, but you know, again, I think it, it is a challenging time for everybody. Yep. Um, and and hoping to hoping to invert the, the trends that we're seeing. And real quick, Jill, to give you some space with this question, because I'd, I'd love to hear from you before we take general questions. Any thoughts from you? Yeah, I think um, one thing that we do at our association is we keep a little bit of a sense of humor, a little bit of brevity, right? Because it's been it's been intense. Yeah. So we joke that um, we're you know people ask the question, what are you going to do with this with slimmer staff and you know a little less people here and there? We're like, we'll just take on two jobs, right? <laughs> everybody, it's like a dual uh, d uh, directorship, right? <laughs> yeah. So everybody will just take two departments. It's working beautifully. No, but seriously, you know what, really, um, I come from like small business um, uh, entrepreneurship and we, we kept our, um, our staff because we loved up on them just yeah. like family. It's yep. just how we roll. It's all about taking care of each other, um, making sure that if they have needs, if uh, a staff member needs to work from home because their babysitter, which is grandma, has to quarantine. And, and you know what? We are so okay with that. Yeah. And I think, and, and you know, also I always, people on my team, I'm like, hey, you know what? We're business partners. We are yeah. business partners. So together, let's build this plan. Let's live it. Let's make it happen. So just really make sure they understand their worth. We could not, we all know that you cannot have the doors open without a great staff. Uh, so just just loving up on them at every chance. So true, so true. Thank you so much for sharing that. Kelsey, I know we're in wrap up mode. Do we have any additional questions? Yes, I just chatted in to um, all of our attendees. Feel free to uh, uh, jump in and ask any questions. We do have two minutes, so we might be able to answer one or two. Um, but I do wanna say while people are thinking through some thoughts, thank you so much to all of our panelists today. Yeah. It was an incredible conversation. I learned a lot. I'm, I know, I'm sure everyone here has. Um, and so we really, really value it. And I will be sending out this recording with a key, uh, a blog takeaway and some key takeaways. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, but yes, I will, I'm looking through the chat to see if any questions have popped in. Um, I don't see any. I know we have two minutes left. Brittany, I want to say thank you also to Community Rec Magazine for helping us uh, sponsor this roundtable. Um, it's been awesome to work with you. Um, and I'll hand it over to you as well, Brittany. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, I, we have like the one minute left. I love to try and end on like a positive note, like a little positive question. Um, so for each of our panelists, I just wanted to see if I could ask you all to just give a quick tip um, as a leader how you are taking care of yourself and how you can suggest other leaders take care of themselves. Um, let's see, Sabrina, can I start with you? 
after actually when I, I became CEO in the middle of the pandemic, May 1st, 2020, um, and realized that I had not taken care of myself. For, I, I was an athlete when I was younger. Um, and I'll say that, so in the last year, I've lost 70 pounds um, because, and I share that because it, it, here's what happened. May happened and I went, oh my gosh, I can't be my best CEO self for Wakeman if I'm not taking care of myself. I was exhausted. I was all of this stuff. So I've reinvented my health journey again. It's not that it just, I forgot it for a little while. Cause I think we, we think taking care of everybody else is the priority and it is, but you have to take care of yourself first before you can take care of everybody else. And I think, and again, so now our teams are like running in road races together and doing stuff because they're modeling that healthy behavior. Amanda, who's on this call, we just ran in her race um, a couple weeks ago as a Wakeman team. And so it becomes contagious. So practice what you preach and take care of yourself. I love that, thank you. Uh, Jill, how about you? Yeah, I mean, um, I start out each day with with a workout <laughs> before the sun comes up. And for me, it's that one little thing in my life that I can control. The You know, my phone is turned off. Um, I'll either head over to the Y, of course, and work out, or I have a, a gym here at the, at the house. And just spending that hour every morning before the sun comes up, it just, it just brings me to a calmness. Um, of course, the endorphins kick in, right? Um, and I won't have an excuse when it's a long day at the Y and I want to come home and just chill with my husband on the deck. So I really think just taking that, that hour to myself every single day before I you know, run into the, the craziness that is the Y life, um, I'm ready to tackle anything at that point. So, Awesome. And uh, Roman, we will finish up with you. Okay, uh, so I think disconnect is my is my advice. Uh, that's what works for me is um, not everything needs to be handled at 10 o'clock at night or eight o'clock at night. So, you know, when you come home, disconnect um, and, and then you'll be stronger the next day. Uh, it's easy to get overwhelmed, but that that moment where you disconnect those few hours, play with your kids, if you have kids do do something else. Um, and, and that's that's my advice. Keep well, a positive uh, attitude. Yes, I love that. Um, yeah, and so I guess we are like two minutes over, but um, yeah, from Community Rec, thank you all. Thank you, Daxco. Uh, this was an awesome discussion. Thank you, thank so you much, everyone. everyone. Have a great rest of your week. Bye. Thanks, Sabrina. Thanks, Jill. Thanks, Roman. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Brittany. Thank you. Bye-bye.